Good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to Protecting Your Health. Morning. <laughs> Welcome to Protecting Your Health after allogeneic transplant. My name is Erin. I'm a nurse with the University of Kansas Cancer Center. Um, I will be your moderator, moderator this morning, and I'm looking forward to hearing from our guest speaker about this important topic. This session is designed to be interactive. I, uh, we ask that you hold your questions until the presentation is completed. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Navit Majhale. <laughs> Dr. Majhale is the director of the Blood and Marrow Transplant Program at the Cleveland Clinic. His research focuses on transplant outcomes, quality of life, and late effects in transplant survivors. Prior to joining Cleveland Clinic, he was a scientific director for the Center of for Blood and Transplant Research and the medical director of health services research at the National Marrow Donor Program. He serves on the steering committee of the National Institutes of Health BMT Late Effects Initiative, which will identify research gaps in late effects of transplant and make recommendations to address them. Joining us for the Q&A session after Dr. Maj Hale's presentation is Dr. Gorgam Akpek. Dr. Akpek is the medical director of the Stem Cell Transplant and Cellular Therapy Program at Rush University Medical Center. Let me, there he is. He previously headed the Stem Cell Transplant Program at Banner MD Anderson Cancer Center in Gilbert, Arizona. His research focuses on allogeneic sibling and unrelated donor transplantation and treatment of graft first host disease, or GVHD. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Moshale. Aaron, thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to be here, and it's really inspiring to be here. I mean, I've seen many patients from our Cleveland Clinic BMT program here. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I trained at the University of Minnesota, and just before coming here, I was standing next to uh, a lady who had a transplant at the University of Minnesota 25 years ago. And uh, uh, I mean, seeing you all here is the reason, and it's the inspiration that keeps people like me going. Uh, to keep working, you know, doing research, trying to do things better for our patients to come. So thank you. So I have been asked to talk about how to protect your health after a donor transplant. Uh, these are my disclosures. They have no relationship to what I'm going to talk about. And uh, what I hope to accomplish today is talk about what are some of the long-term complications of transplant. Uh, talk about some of the predisposing or risk factors for these complications and what can you do to prevent them from happening you know, and uh, what can you do uh, to come up with a plan to be in charge of your own care so you can hopefully uh, either prevent some of these complications or uh, detect them early so that can, they can be treated at the right time. Now you'll hear the term BMT survivor being used pretty often over this weekend, you know, and I thought to get things going, let's talk about who is a BMT survivor. And uh, all of you are BMT survivors at the time you were diagnosed with your cancer or your blood disease. And again, you have to keep in mind, it does not only include you as a patient, it includes anyone who has been impacted by this experience. So it includes your loved ones, your family, your caregivers uh, who have been uh, impacted by your journey uh, through this process. What we'll be focusing on over this weekend is long-term transplant survivors. So long-term means patients who are months to years post-transplant. And as you survive longer and longer post-transplant, the chances of your underlying cancer or blood disease coming back goes down dramatically. And that is where the focus instead transitions to how do we uh, prevent complications and how do we focus on recovery. Now, you are not alone, and this is some research we did through our registry in the United States, where we estimated that in 2015, 16, there would be around 160, 170,000 transplant survivors in the United States. And if our transplant rates continue as what they were uh, in 2009, we would have close to half a million transplant survivors by the uh, time we get to 2030. So again, highlights the advancements and the extensive research that's ongoing to make transplants safer and better for our patients. 
Now, on the same note, uh, we have this other research that we did, which, again, focuses on and highlights the fact that the longer you are post-transplant, uh, the better your chances of surviving long-term as well. Uh, so in this study, we showed that if you are alive and cancer-free at two years after your transplant, 80 to 90 percent of our patients would be alive at 10 to 15 years post-transplant as well. Again, just to highlight, I mean, how well our patients do, at least from a longevity standpoint, as they go further out post-transplant. And by the time you get to three, four, five years, it is not unusual for us to start using the term cure, that you've been cured of your underlying blood disease or your cancer because of the transplant. Now, what are long-term effects or long-term complications that we'll focus on today? Uh, these are medical conditions that occur months to years after transplant. So these can be new things that happen after transplant and persist long-term. For example, sometimes our patients get diabetes or high blood pressure after the transplant itself, and they persist for years and years and years. Uh, on the other hand, these can be conditions that happen many months or years down the road, and you can attribute the chemo, radiation, medications, other things that happen around transplant as possible causative factors for those conditions. Now, a few things I want to emphasize before I go forward. Uh, first, uh, the common things that happen in this setting are not very severe. You know, I mean, things like fatigue, neuropathy, they do affect your functional status. Again, not to minimize the fact that they do impact your life and your lifestyle, uh, but most of them are not severe. Uh, they uh, are not life-threatening. Now, the severe or life-threatening complications are rare. They don't happen very often. And the majority of them are treatable or preventable and do need close monitoring as you uh, go long-term from this experience. Now, this is a list of some of the long-term effects. We'll touch on these a bit today as well, but these can range from chronic graft versus host disease uh, to organ damage, to infections, chronic fatigue, and we are increasingly recognizing the impact of these long-term effects on caregivers as well. I mean, because sometimes if our patients have to undergo through a lot of care post-transplantations, uh, it, it does impact their, our patients' caregivers as well. The one concept I want to focus on next is the concept of risk factors or predisposing factors. So these are exposures or things that our patients may be exposed to either before their transplant, during their transplant, or after transplant that impacts the chances of developing a late complication or a long-term effect. Now, different exposures or different risk factors can impact your chances of getting a certain late complication uh, the one thing I again want to emphasize is that if you have those predisposing factors, it is not necessary you'll for sure get that complication. And on the other hand, uh, you may get the complication even though you may not have that predisposing or risk factor. So again, I mean, these are signals that tell us, okay, a given patient might be more or less likely to, to develop something, but by themselves they don't necessarily predict or say for sure that the event or that medical issue is going to happen. So this figure tries to synthesize and uh, kind of uh, develops this concept a bit more. And uh, so these risk factors or predisposing factors can occur prior to your transplant, so pre-BMT. Uh, things like kidney disease, diabetes, hypertension can be present even before you're diagnosed uh, with your cancer or blood disease. Then once you get diagnosed with, say, your leukemia, for instance, you will get chemotherapy that can impact what happens many years down the road, independent of the transplant. Then, of course, you get more chemotherapy, sometimes radiation, around the transplant itself. And then you can have things like graft-versus-host disease or infections or other drugs, I mean, like cyclosporin, tacrolimus, or steroids or prednisone that can also impact what happens long-term post-transplant. Now, at the same time, we have these other things that impact the whole continuum. You know, we all keep getting older with time. Transplant doesn't make us younger, you know. So uh, age with age does come, I mean, medical issues and other conditions that we have to be cognizant of. Uh, some things are dependent on our gender. You know, we have genetic predisposition to heart disease, cancers, other things. I mean, that's a part of our genes. And there are lifestyle factors like smoking as well. You know, so all of these things can impact this whole continuum right from before transplant to much later post-transplant. 
the reason to understand this concept is important is because uh, it helps us put into context what is the preventive care strategy we need to think about for a given patient. So for example, a 10-year-old with a blood disease like Fanconi's anemia who has no graft versus host disease, what that child is going to be at risk for uh, or predisposed to over the next 10, 15, 20, 30 years is going to be very different than a 60-year-old with acute leukemia who has graft versus host disease. Uh, the kind of a preventive care package or preventive care plan you establish for that 10-year-old is going to be very different compared to what you might have in mind for a 60-year-old with graft versus host disease. And that is where you have to put that, those risk factors uh, those, uh, uh, those risk factors and predisposing factors into context when you come up with what your preventive care plan is going to be. So next, let's look at some of the complications that can happen in this setting. This is not a comprehensive list, and again, uh, I'll be focusing on some of the common things. We'll talk about some of the preventive mechanisms for those complications as well. Uh, and I'll try to go through this quickly in the interest of time. So chronic graft versus host disease is certainly something we always look for in our patients who get a donor transplant. Uh, despite having the best match possible, almost half of our patients still get graft versus host disease. And we've gotten a lot better over time in, in, with respect to preventing, predicting, and treating graft versus host disease, but we still have a lot of room for more research and improvement in this area. Uh, common organs involved can be the skin, the mouth, the eyes, intestines, uh, the lung, and it is treated with more immune suppression. And again, you have to keep in mind, and this is not true for just graft versus host disease, for any complications I'll talk about. Uh, there's a whole spectrum, you know, as to the severity of these complications of graft versus host disease. Uh, the majority of our patients, if they do get this complication, they are more, more in the mild to medium uh, intensity category. But once in a while, uh, our patients have more severe complications or severe graft versus host disease. And at least in the setting of graft versus host disease, you need to be on immune suppression, sometimes lifelong uh, as well. So looking at the eyes, uh, you can be at risk for cataracts or dry eyes, especially if you have graft versus host disease or if you have received radiation as a part of your treatment or transplant. And we do recommend uh, an ophthalmology exam at least once a year, uh, more for preventive care. And if you have graft versus host disease of the eyes, obviously you need more ongoing follow-up uh, with uh, uh, the ophthalmologist for its treatment and management. Uh, graft versus host disease can impact the mouth, so can radiation, if you've received that, uh, can cause dry mouth as well. Uh, the treatment depends on the severity and uh, uh, whether or not there's active graft versus host disease with that. And we recommend at least a dental exam once a year. Uh, now, I mean, there might be different needs with respect to what the dentist might want to do. And I think that's where it's important to have a conversation with your transplant team as well, especially if you have active graft versus host disease and are on ongoing immune suppression. Then moving down from the head to the lungs, uh, there is this complication called bronchiolitis obliterans, which is basically a form of graft versus host disease of uh, the lungs. It is not very common, and uh, almost 10 to 20% of our patients can get it. Again, there's a whole spectrum. I mean, uh, most patients, they'll have some shortness of breath. You do more investigations like CAT scans, bronchoscopies, and you find out this is what it is. And it's treated essentially like graft versus host disease, and we give more immune suppression. Uh, there can be a risk for pneumonia, uh, especially if you are on immune suppression uh, medications that's ongoing. And this is where it is important to get a flu shot once a year. Uh, make sure you're up to date with your immunizations post-transplant. In the post-transplant setting, very often we'll give a vaccination against uh, a pneumonia, the pneumovax, and it's important that you're up to speed with that. Uh, if you're still smoking, you need to stop. And uh, <laughs> I can't be any more blunt than that. You know, you got to stop. And if you need help in stopping smoking, work with your transplant provider or your primary care physician, for instance. Uh, heart can be involved very rarely, uh, especially if you've had radiation into the chest area or uh, you've received certain drugs, chemotherapy drugs, as a part of your leukemia treatment or transplant. 
Again, common things, exercising, you know, good diet, controlling cholesterol, high blood pressure, diabetes, if those are underlying issues. Very rarely. I mean, again, this is a percent or 2% or less uh, in terms of its prevalence. We'll see things like stroke, uh, arrhythmia, or blood clots, which could be attributed to the transplant or the treatments before or thereafter. Uh, the GI tract can be involved. Our patients can have symptoms like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, you know, weight loss as well. And what I've seen or learned from our patients is, I mean, you have to uh, try different things. You know, certain things work well for certain patients. You know, other foods work better for certain patients. So sometimes you have to uh, 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 try out different uh, uh, foods and see what works for you. And very often we'll have them see our nutrition therapist as well in our cancer institute to see if they can help them out, uh, come up with a strategy for this. Uh, the endocrine organs, like the thyroid gland, can be Im impacted, especially if you've had graft versus host disease or if you've had radiation uh, to your neck region. It is fairly common, can be detected by a simple blood test called TSH, and uh, the treatment is fairly straightforward as well. You can give uh, uh, the thyroid hormone as replacement uh, for that deficiency. Hypogonadism or low sex hormone levels is fairly common. I mean, early menopause in our younger women it can occur. And uh, in men, we have this term called menopause as well. I mean, basically, it's a low testosterone level, which can cause a whole variety of uh, issues, ranging from decreased libido to uh, fatigue and tiredness. Uh, radiation increases this risk. So does graft versus host disease. Uh, the, again, the severity varies. And that is where we'll frequently work with our colleagues in gynecology or urology to see if our patients need any treatment for these underlying conditions. Muscles and bones can be impacted as well. You know, I mean, increases, uh, if the risk increases if you've had graft versus host disease or are on prednisone. Again, regular exercise to prevent it. And in our patients who have more severe symptoms, we'll have physical therapy or occupational therapy get involved. And on the same note, bone loss can occur in this setting as well. Uh, almost uh, 10 to 25 percent of our patients will have osteoporosis. It's not very often that we see fractures related to osteoporosis, but again, this is something we suggest we screen for uh, at around a year post transplant, and if, if needed, uh, more frequently thereafter. Uh, prevention is exercise, calcium, vitamin D, provided there are no contraindications or reasons not to take calcium and vitamin D. Uh, then we have these uh, second cancers. Uh, these are cancers other than the cancer you were uh, treated with a transplant for. So if you were treated with a transplant for leukemia or MDS, very rarely you know, another kind of leukemia, MDS, can happen as well. Uh, the cancer treatments you've had can potentially predispose you to getting these cancers. Again, I have to emphasize that as we grow older, we're always at increasing risk of the many cancers anyway. And because of the exposures or risk factors you've had before transplant or during transplant, your risk goes up slightly. Uh, but then again, these are very rare events. These are not some things that happen fairly often. And very often, we'll do uh, screening slightly different than what we do for somebody else your age uh, to be on top of preventing these cancers from coming up or detecting them early. So when we think of second cancers, we think of leukemia MDS, which is almost exclusively seen in the setting of autologous transplantation. Uh, I mean, we don't see this as often in our donor transplant recipients. So when I talk about second cancers, or second leukemia and MDS, these are leukemias MDS that are different from the leukemia MDS you were transplanted for. So almost never happens in our patients who get a donor transplant because you've got, got that ongoing uh, immune mechanism that's preventing your leukemia from coming back. Then we have solid tumors like skin cancer, like breast cancer, like colon cancer. Uh, again, very rare. We see it in 2 to 5% of our patients at 10 to 15 years post-transplant. Uh, but uh, uh, again, we, uh, this is where we do ask our patients to be cognizant of this. We do screening for our patients as well, uh, which, as I mentioned, can be slightly different than what we might recommend for somebody your age. So it might be a bit more intense and more uh, uh, frequent than what you might be getting if you hadn't had a transplant. 
Uh, we do know that certain things can predispose you for certain kinds of cancer. So if you have chronic GVHD of the mouth and the skin, you might be more at risk for oral cancers or skin cancers. And that is where you know, we'll watch those organs a bit more closely. Uh, if you've had radiation to your chest, uh, especially as a woman, uh, you might be more at risk for breast cancers. And that is where you know, we might be asking you to get screening uh, mammograms or other investigations a bit more frequently or earlier than what we might do for somebody else who hasn't had a transplant. Uh, infections can happen as well. I talked about being uh, up to date with your immunizations, uh, the flu shot every year as well. And sometimes in the setting of a certain procedure, like if you're seeing a dentist, depending on what procedure is being considered, you might need some antibiotics to prevent infections as well. Now, uh, Vaccinations we talked about as well, and we tend to avoid live vaccines like measles, mumps, rubella, if you are having active graft versus disease and are uh, on immune suppression medications. So vaccinations are really important because this is a simple fix for many of the infections that our patients are predisposed to. And uh, uh, if you haven't had vaccinations, uh, these uh, immunizations, I think it's important for you to go back and connect with your transplant team or your doctor to talk about, do you still need them at this point or not? Now, the one thing I want to emphasize again, I mean, listening to all these complications, you might be thinking, I mean, oh my God, I'm going to get sick. You know? And again, I'll emphasize again that most of these complications are not very common. You know, the common ones are easily controlled, and the more life-threatening, uh, serious complications don't happen as often. Just a quick a word about functional recovery, I won't go into this as much because there are a number of excellent sessions happening today and tomorrow with a number of excellent speakers who will talk more about many of these issues like quality of life and uh, uh, recovery post-transplantation. And uh, uh, research and in my own, ex own experience, you know, transplant survivors uh, in general do report a lot of growth and learning through this experience as well. You know, I mean, a uh, lot more appreciation of life, and a lot of times when I talk to my patients, they do tell me uh, sometimes a shift in their priorities as well. Uh, again, a lot of sessions today and tomorrow we'll talk about psychological issues, both for patients and caregivers, you know, chemo brain, cognitive issues, uh, sexual health, infertility uh, is certainly an issue for our younger patients. A return to school, return to work, obviously is a big challenge as well. Again, I wanted to list them so that you all know this is, uh, these are things and issues we need to think about in the context of recovery. Uh, these are as important as some of the physical symptoms or signs you might be facing, and there'll be a lot more discussion about this over the next two days. Now, moving on and talking about how can we take care of your health in this journey and process. And I always tell my patients, you have to build your support network. You know, and uh, it does not have to be the transplant center only. I mean, it can be your oncologist, a primary care physician, can be other specialists like an ophthalmologist, you know, a dentist, a gynecologist, a social worker, physical therapist. And who you use in this network can depend on where you're at post-transplant and what your needs are. I mean, if you're six months out, have graft versus source disease, you might be using certain people from this network compared to if you're two years out or 10 years out and are doing okay. Uh, but it's important to find out who are the people you need to go to uh, if you have issues and who will be looking out for you as you go through this process. Uh, the one thing you can do for yourself is be an advocate. I think just being here today is, a, is, is obviously a great sign that you want to learn, uh, you want to empower yourself with information. So this is a good first step. Ask questions. Uh, don't hesitate to ask for a second opinion if needed. Uh, do establish a primary care provider, especially if you're quite a bit out post-transplant. Again, I'll be honest. I mean, uh, my internal medicine colleagues know a lot more about managing cholesterol and blood pressure uh, than I do as a transplant. I can take care of that around the first six months, one year post-transplant. But as I'm thinking about preventing heart disease, role of aspirin, you know, cholesterol medications, uh, they know more about this and, than, uh, than what uh, uh, I know or I would like to know about because my focus is very different. Uh, learn about your treatment and risk factors. I mean, the more you know about what has happened to you, the more you can learn from resources like this place, uh, other places, to see what your needs and requirements should be, what your preventive care plan should be. 
and uh, uh, support clinical trials and research. You know, I mean, there are still a lot of ongoing research studies, even in the context of graft versus host disease, in the context of long-term follow-up and survivorship. So try and see how you can inform things more so we can get better for patients who come after you. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this slide. Again, a lot more discussion over this weekend about coping with uh, symptoms and uh, issues post-transplant. Uh, I want to finish off by showing you some resources that you can use to get some more knowledge about this. So in 2011, a group of transplant experts, including myself, we came together, and it was an international group, and uh, we looked at the literature, the research that's out there, uh, we looked at our collective experience and came up with some recommendations for what this preventive care plan should look like for our transplant patients who are many years post-transplant. How can we prevent these late complications from happening? Now, our uh, colleagues at our national registry, Be The Batch, the National Donor Program, were gracious to support the translation of that scientific document to patient-friendly materials. Uh, so, I mean, you can get them online at bethematch.org. Uh, you can, you know, download them. You can uh, take a look at them. And if you go to your app store, the iPhone app store or the Android marketplace, and I think if you search for transplant guidelines, uh, this is the first app that comes up. Uh, it has got what you need to do, you know, every six months, once a year after that. Uh, it has uh, a chronic GVHD symptom checker. Uh, you can set reminders, and also uh, you can uh, uh, customize these, this based on what your needs are. Uh, so, for example, you can choose your age, your gender, the type of transplant you've had, whether you got radiation, whether or not you have graft versus host disease. And what it does is it gives you a synthesis of these recommendations based on what your exposures are. And you can email them. You can print them out. So it's a cool app uh, from that perspective. Again, I think this session is focused more towards adults, but uh, for our pediatric transplant survivors, uh, we also have uh, CureSearch.org, which has some more specific recommendations for children who've had a transplant. And you can use these follow-up guidelines to educate and inform yourself. Now, all the recommendations may not apply to you, as I've emphasized before. Uh, you have to look and see what your risk factors, exposures, predisposing factors are, and what is going to be your preventive care plan. Uh, but what this resource can do is it can set the stage for a discussion with your providers as to what your needs are going to be. So it can set the foundation for that. And you can say, well, these guidelines say I should get a DEXA scan. Do I really need one? And that is where you can have the discussion and say, all right, is this right for me or is this not needed for me? So uh, in the last slide, I just want to uh, share some of these resources that you can utilize that are very transplant specific, uh, especially BMT InfoNet, you know, NBMT Link. Uh, Be The Match also has an extensive section on uh, uh, resources for survivorship care post-transplantation. Uh, so I think these are a number of uh, opportunities for educating yourself, empowering yourself about what your needs might be and uh, what needs to be done. Uh, I do want to uh, uh, mention the Meredith Cowden Foundation as well. I see Marty and Jerry here in front with me. They have set up a nice resource for patients with chronic GVHD as well. And uh, that's another great resource you can use for learning more, especially if you have chronic graphosis or disease. So with this, I'm going to end, and uh, we'll have uh, ample time for questions. If you have questions, uh, I would request you use the microphone if possible, uh, because we are recording these sessions, uh, because uh, uh, I think BMT InfoNet wants to put them online for our patients who could not be here. Uh, so uh, happy to address any questions you might have. So the question is about the flu vaccine and whether it's a live vaccine, and you were told not to get the flu vaccine because it's a live vaccine. Now, the flu shot or the flu vaccine comes in two different forms. You know, one is the shot, uh, which is 
a killed virus. Essentially, it's the protein from the virus itself that's used to make that vaccine. Uh, and the second is a live vaccine, where you essentially beat down that virus so it doesn't cause the disease in a person with a healthy immune system, uh, but does give you the immunity against it. Uh, so at least for the first, so uh, all of you should at least get the shot. You know, that is the killed vaccine. Okay, so that is something you can safely get. Uh, there are no contraindications to getting that vaccine unless you have an allergy to its ingredients. You know, so, I mean, there are some chemicals that are used to make that vaccine. And if you're allergic to that, then you can't get it. But uh, besides that circumstance, which is very rare, you should be getting a flu shot every year. Now, if you're many years out doing okay, no graft versus host disease, healthy immune system, I mean, you could potentially get the live vaccine as well, which is basically a squirt in your nose. Uh, but uh, uh, at least a flu shot, uh, I mean, should be taken by everyone once a year. We have a question there. Uh, I noticed that you have hypothyroidism listed. Have you seen any connection with hyperparathyroidism with GVHD? And so hyper, the question is hyperparathyroidism. And uh, for the people in the audience, just to explain what the question is about, uh, the thyroid gland is more in our neck. Uh, that produces the thyroid hormone, which is a hormone that regulates many of our body functions. You know, and if it goes low, you feel fatigued, tired, you can have you know, heart issues, a whole variety of things. Now, the parathyroid glands are also embedded right next to the thyroid glands, and they help in monitoring our calcium metabolism. Okay, so they are the uh, glands which make the parathyroid hormone uh, which regulate the calcium levels in our body. Now, uh, sometimes what can happen is uh, those parathyroid glands can also get affected. You know, I mean, if you have had radiation to your neck region, uh, the levels can go down. Uh, the parathyroid glands, the parathyroid hormone, are closely regulated with the kidneys as well. You know, and that is where if you have kidney issues post-transplant, that can impact the parathyroid glands as well. And that is where those hormone levels can go high or low. Uh, so it's not, especially if you have kidney issues post-transplant, it may not be unusual to have uh, hyperactivity of the parathyroid glands, and that is what your question was. And uh, again, I think in that setting, if that's the case, usually we'll see some signals. For example, your calcium level, your kidney function, creatinine levels, will give us a sense of if there's an issue around there, and then we do some more investigations, and then we determine what the treatment for that is going to be. So I had two questions. Uh, the first one is about uh, immunizations, um, the timing. Uh, my understanding, at least for my treatment, I'm at seven months, and that I won't be getting any vaccinations till one year. And you know, my understanding of why that is is because we don't want to have an active immune response to potentially have acute GVHD. Um, also, I'm on immunosuppressive, so in some sense, I, I don't believe the vaccines would be as effective as they're supposed to be. Uh, so I'm a little unclear on the timing because I think you said three to six months. Um, so that's my first question. My second question is uh, how does exercise relate to GVHD? Um, my doctor has uh, some concern that uh, you can get uh, GVHD in the muscle and uh, I'm kind of dying to uh, ride my bike the way I'd like to. Uh, but he's discouraging that. So I just wanted to get your input on those two things. Thanks. So addressing your first question, which is around vaccinations. And uh, again, I, I think different transplant centers do things slightly differently. And the reason for that is there are a couple of things we think about. Uh, you know, first, like you rightly mentioned, when if you have graft versus host disease or if your immune system is low, you may not be able to mount a good response uh, to the vaccine that you get, right? So your body may not be able to make those good immune cells that you need to prevent those diseases. Now, having said that, I think the guidelines and what most places do is, uh, especially for the killed vaccines, you know, so these are uh, bacteria or virus proteins that are used to make those vaccines. These are not live bacteria or live vaccines. Uh, we do typically start at three to six months post-transplant. You know, so, I mean, recognizing the fact that there is some likelihood you may not be able to respond to those vaccines and make those immune uh, cells that you need, uh, but, I mean, there's a good chance that you'll make some. 
a uh, lot of times, uh, at least in our place, uh, what our infectious disease doctors will do is, uh, once you're off your immune suppression or you're a year, year and a half, or two years out, uh, they'll sometimes check your antibody levels to see what kind of an immune response you have. And they might give you a booster vaccine as well. Okay. Uh, so, but that's not needed necessarily. Uh, different centers do different things. But again, I would encourage you to talk to your team and see uh, if uh, you would be a candidate for the killed vaccines, uh, given that you're almost a year out uh, or close to it. Uh, now, the live vaccines are a slightly different situation, and we talked about that. Uh, if you have ongoing graft-versus-host disease, you, have, uh, you are on immune suppression. We ask you to avoid the live vaccines because, uh, I mean, uh, although they are attenuated viruses, they are viruses or bacteria that have been uh, uh, knocked down to a low intensity level. If your immune system is low, they can still cause issues. Now, coming to your second question uh, about exercise in the setting of transplant. Now, I, I think it's very controversial whether exercise can cause muscle graft versus host disease. You know? And I think if you look at the research out there in general, looking at the benefits and risks of, uh, of exercising in this setting, I think the advantages certainly outweigh any risks you might have for exacerbating graft versus host disease. So at least for my patients, I do encourage them to do what they can. I, I mean, listen to your body is what I tell them. You know, see what you can do, I mean, based on how you're feeling. Uh, I tell them to push themselves a little bit, not a lot, you know, but I do encourage them to exercise as much as they can uh, through this process because the GVHD itself, uh, the treatments for it, like prednisone, can profoundly affect your muscles, you know, and, uh, you know, it can make you weak and deconditioned, and that is something you want to avoid. Okay. Question there. Uh, my question is, how do you monitor for those secondary cancers? Is it done by blood work or diagnostics, or can you explain a little bit about that briefly? Sure, absolutely. So the question is around how do you screen or prevent those second cancers? And again, emphasizing that they're extremely rare events, you know, and uh, most of the guidelines are pretty similar to what we would do somebody your age and gender who hasn't had a transplant, for example. Uh, I'll, in some places, it's different. And I'll give you some examples as to where it is different and where it's the same. Uh, uh, for colon cancers, we follow the same recommendations as what you might need if you hadn't had leukemia or MDS, hadn't had any chemotherapy, no GBHD. So that would be the same as what would be recommended if you had none of this happening to you. Uh, if you are a woman who's had uh, 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 a transplant and had radiation to the chest region, we usually advise starting mammograms sooner. You know, again, when do you do mammograms in healthy women is very controversial. You know, 40 versus 50. I mean, it was in the news in the recent past. I mean, every six months, I mean, it, it flares up again. Uh, but we know historically that there's a slightly higher risk of breast cancers in our uh, women patients uh, who've had radiation to the chest region. Uh, so that is where we'll recommend that you start mammograms at around eight years after receiving radiation or at age 25. Uh, uh, whichever occurs later, you know. So we'll. So that is where where some of the differences are compared to that. Uh, I'm trying to think which other circumstances are present where we uh, look at second cancers differently. So the other one is if you have graft versus host disease of the mouth or the skin, you know, we'll be more cognizant and more aware to do a skin exam at least once a year or do a comprehensive you know, look in your mouth to make sure there are no lesions in your mouth that look different that need a referral to an ENT doctor, for example. Uh, so these are the common things. So most of the recommendations are similar to what it is for the general population. Uh, but for some, they are slightly different. And uh, that's based on what your risk factors and exposures are. And then one more question. Um, I've heard of people getting secondary blood cancers after going through a primary leukemia or something. Is that monitored by blood work? So first, uh, in the setting of a donor transplant, you know, when you're getting donor stem cells from somebody else, it is so rare to see a second leukemia come up. I mean, you're looking at less than half a percent uh, incidence or risk over, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, uh, and, I mean, again, in that setting, the thought is that's leukemia happening in the donor cells, not your own cells. Okay. 
so the majority of time when the leukemia comes back, it's usually our own leukemia coming back, especially in the early time period. So it's, it's a very rare event that we see almost exclusively in our patients who've had an autologous transplant, you know, where they use their own blood stem cells. There is no immune effect that's happening in preventing the leukemia from coming back, and the chemotherapy they've had before can sometimes, once in a while, predispose from getting those leukemia blood cancers. Uh, I mean, if you're post-transplant, you'll be getting your blood work, you know, your blood counts monitored every so often anyways, and you don't have to do anything more than that to monitor for that. Um, mine is a comment, and maybe um, you have a follow-up to it. I just completed uh, four years of um, reconstructive dentistry um, because of severe dry mouth, and um, I consulted three dentists um, prior to this one who did the reconstruction. Most of those three dentists and most that I've... Um, heard others talk about are not aware how to treat severe dry mouth. And I um, was treated with regular composite fillings for a year to the tune of $10,000, and they broke down. I found a dentist who understood dry mouth, and the correct fillings to use are glass ionomer that do not break down in a dry mouth. And then I underwent transplants, I mean, um, implants and um, crown work. So um, I would be happy afterwards if anybody wanted to talk to me about um, my trial and error in finding a dentist who understood how to treat this severe GVHD of the mouth. Thank you. So thank, thank you for that comment. And, yeah. and I, I, I just want to take this opportunity to make a higher level observation or comment. You know? And that is uh, blood cancers, blood diseases for which we do transplants are very rare to begin with. You know? And for, if you then drill down to the number of patients who actually need a bone marrow transplant, that's even smaller. As I showed you, I mean, there are probably 150, 160,000 transplant survivors today in the U.S., and if you compare that with the U.S. population of 30, 40 million uh, people, that's just a fraction of uh, the uh, uh, people that a given clinician or a dentist or a practitioner will see. I mean, some of them may not see a BMT survivor in their lifetime. You know, so they don't, they're not aware of some of these issues. They're not aware of some of the treatments that are needed for this. And that goes back to what I mentioned in my presentation. Uh, learn about what you need, what your preventive plan has to be. Uh, work with your team. I mean, usually at transplant centers, very often, they might have some contacts or would know certain providers who might be dealing with those issues so they can make a referral. Uh, don't hesitate to ask for a second opinion. You know, if something doesn't feel right, you think things are not going the right way, I mean, uh, you can uh, go and see somebody else who might be able to offer you a different perspective on it. And I can tell you from a clinician perspective, if a patient comes and tells me, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad with what you're doing, but I want to go to someplace else to see what they offer, maybe they have a clinical trial, I'm always for it. You know, it's always easier, maybe they're local, and I always tell them, it's certainly fine, you know, do that. And if they have something else to offer, I'll be happy to do that here for you if it makes sense to me. Uh, but that is where I think our providers have to be open as well uh, to that, those options. Um, mine kind of goes with the previous lady. Um, I have a chronic GVHD of the mouth, and I've been doing, I have um, been have trouble eating, keeping on play. Um, and so I'm doing photophoresis for it pain management, is there anything else that you recommend? So maybe we can talk offline about uh, your specific case. Uh, but then again, uh, 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 with respect to the treatment of graft versus host disease, I mean, these are the conditions or therapies that we usually use. Uh, the uh, uh, ECP, the photophoresis that you're on, sometimes immune suppression. Uh, the one thing I would ask you to do is uh, come and say hi to uh, Jerry and Marty, who are sitting up here front. I don't know if you know them. Maybe you can raise your hands, uh, this thing. So they run the Meredith Cowden Foundation for uh, GVHD. Uh, I mean, their daughter uh, has GVHD, uh, is one of our patients at the Cleveland Clinic. 
uh, with my colleague, Dr. Kaleshu, and they've done a tremendous amount of work in uh, focusing more on GVHD, and they have a symposium coming up in uh, uh, Pittsburgh uh, okay. and uh, next month, you know, in two weeks from now. So yeah. I would ask you to connect with them, and they can also offer you some support and resources. And okay. we can talk offline after this meeting okay. is done. Thank you. A question at the back there. So the question is, what is the common long-term effect for children who got chemotherapy, transplant, radiation for leukemia? And uh, uh, my answer would be, it's hard to generalize it. You know, uh, again, it all depends on the type of chemotherapy you got, the type of transplant you got, radiation to which sites, for example, and how much radiation. So it, it all goes back to what were your predisposing factors and what that uh, puts you at risk for. Uh, common things we see in this setting are, especially if you were really small at the time of these treatments, you know, before puberty, uh, you might have issues with growth and development, you know, so you might have growth issues. Um, uh, and a uh, uh, lot of the other things are pretty similar. You know, if you have graft versus host disease, I mean, effects in the eye, mouth, lungs, heart, for instance, uh, I mean, uh, we tend to be a bit more cognizant about cardiac issues as well, especially if you've had radiation long term. Uh, so again, these are, uh, I mean, they are somewhat similar, somewhat different, but at the same time, it all depends on what the specific exposures were. I got one about uh, immunizations. So that I was understood that I was not going to receive the chicken pox or the shingles vaccination because it is a live virus, but from uh, my transplant team has told me, well, from the immunization side of it, that I did receive some live vaccines for, like, for measles and mumps. Is yep. that true or not, or what's your so, basically uh, the issue around uh, chickenpox shingles vaccines is a slightly bit controversial than the measles mom rubella they're both live vaccines they're, they're, they're both using live viruses and if you have ongoing graft versus host disease if you're on immune suppression then you cannot get those vaccines but say i mean you're otherwise doing fine you're two years out uh, we do definitely have good data on the use of the mmr the measles mumps rubella vaccine uh, the data are not as clear with respect to the benefit of a shingles vaccine or a zoster vaccine, uh, but very often we will do that for our patients. You know, so what our, what we'll do is uh, we'll look for uh, the titers for your antibodies against shingles in that setting, and if they are low, our infectious disease colleagues do recommend that you get that vaccine, even though it's a live vaccine, provided you don't have graft versus host disease. Thank you. Yep. So we have a question in the back, then I'll come back to you. My name is Alyssa, um, and I was diagnosed with um, T-cell ALL in uh, 2012. I got my transplant in 2013 um, and just relapsed again um, in December of this year, or this past year. Um, and I wanted to go back to what you said that it, so that I can make sure I understood you correctly. Um, you, from what I comprehended of what you said, uh, when cancer comes back after you've had a transplant um, and remission from leukemia, uh, what I understood was that it's usually the donor cells that the, the cancer is caused from? Is, so, that, is that what I understood? Uh, let, no. No. So, okay. no, that is what, not what I meant. Uh, and, again, uh, sorry to hear that your uh, leukemia has relapsed, you know. I mean, uh, so we – so let, let me clarify that. Let me clarify that a bit more. It's an important concept. Uh, for most of our patients with acute leukemia, MDS, you know, other blood disorders, when the leukemia comes back after your transplant, 99.9% .9 of the time it's the same leukemia coming back. Okay. But it came back differently this time. I'm sorry, say that again? It came back differently this time. It didn't come back in my bone marrow. It came back in my lymph nodes. Okay. But they still call it leukemia? So, the, uh, again, we can talk about the specifics offline, but uh, the way uh, the T-cell leukemia works 
it does have a predilection to go to the lymph nodes as well, unlike some of the other leukemias uh, that we see. Uh, so that is where it could be a, uh, a leukemia. So you can have either blood manifestations or lymph node manifestations as a part of the spectrum of the same disease. You know, so again, uh, donor cell leukemia is really very, very uncommon. You know, it's like I said, less than half a percent, and it's very unlikely that would be the case if you see the leukemia coming back. Okay. Okay. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> yes. So uh, just knowing about stress and tension in general, I mean, uh, it could potentially impact your GVHD because at the end of the day, I mean, some of that does impact your immune system as well, right? But uh, there is no research or papers that do show uh, that there truly is any association with uh, stress and graft versus host disease. Now, again, you have to keep in mind that the... Uh, Absence of evidence doesn't mean there's evidence of absence, right? So, I mean, uh, uh, people, maybe if you look, look at it more, in more detail, we might see something. And uh, I can tell you that we did do a large clinical trial through our cooperative group in the United States where we enrolled uh, uh, hundreds of patients to look at uh, stress management and exercise before transplant to see if that impacts the risks of, you know, GVHD survival whole variety of endpoints. They did not see any impact on the risks of graft-versus-host disease with the stress management techniques that we investigated in that study. But having said that, there could be a potential link. With Social Security, there's no, there's no relation to it. With Social Security, there's no relation to it? With Social Security disability, okay. there is no uh, relation to it. So the relationship between Social Security disability and GVHD? is what you're asking. <laughs> there's, uh, there's no evidence for it, but again, uh, uh, no one has looked. <laughs> Hopefully not, yeah. Other questions? Have I exhausted all questions? Here, in the back. So the question is, or the comment was, uh, uh, that my colleague in the back has had many patients uh, come to her uh, with skin GVHD who have been trying uh, natural treatments and Ayurveda for it. Uh, personally, I don't have any experience with that, uh, so I don't think I'll be able to comment on uh, my experience with those treatments. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. So GVHD of the lungs is uh, something called bronchiolitis obliterans, you know, and uh, uh, what, what happens is the immune attack is directed towards uh, some of the small airways in your lungs, and it causes constriction of those airways, and that is why uh, our patients will have uh, sometimes uh, shortness of breath, for instance, or other lung issues related to that. Now, the uh, uh, treatment for that is usually steroids or prednisone or other drugs that we are investigating. Uh, there are clinical trials ongoing. Uh, the success rate in treating that is getting better over time, and part of the reason is we are getting better at identifying it sooner. You know, at many places now we'll routinely do these lung tests called pulmonary function tests early on post-transplant, and you know, if we see those numbers start dropping, I mean, we'll follow them more closely and start intervening much before it has reached an advanced stage. Uh, so if you're asking about, you know, the difference that has happened uh, more recently in that condition, so a lot of clinical trials ongoing, a lot of new drugs being investigated, and we are getting better and better at detecting that earlier than what we usually do. We have time for about one more question. Anybody? 
I think people are having question exhaustion. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I am exhausted. <laughs> Well, thank you, Dr. Majel, and okay. thank you, audience, for your great uh, questions and interaction. Uh, this <laughs> this does conclude the first morning session. There is a 15-minute um, passing break. As you leave, make sure you pick up a copy of the long-term follow-up guidelines that Dr. Majel mentioned, and um, make sure to check out the silent auction items out for, for bid. Thanks, guys. <laughs>